Let's go to student view. Your screen now lo should look like that, similar. I go to modules. And I go to GIS data. And I see geocoding session dot zip. All right. Welcome to the strange land of the zip folders. Remember the first session we had and we are like halfway to class, it's like, oh, zip files. Let's do this again. All right, I click on the geocoding session dot zip file. Everyone follows me? Huh. Log into Canvas, go to your GIS class, find GIS data module. All right, who's there yet? Who's not there yet? Put it on jump drive or local download. We'll work on this. Oh, yeah, wait. Good. Next point, Alana. Next point. Before I go and download this, I create a new folder. A new folder on my C drive or jump drive. It might be easier to do it first on your C drive if you're on a student's lab computer. Turns out that if you plug in a jump drive, you have to create have to have at least one folder in that jump drive to have ArcGIS Bro recognize the system when it boots up. It's a little bit annoying. Let's do it on a C drive and then we can copy and paste over at the end. Alright? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my Windows File Explorer. There's a ton of stuff you don't have to worry about. I go into my local C drive. Yeah. Bing, 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 bing. And I need to switch off Dropbox. All right. I'm going to create a new folder in my file explorer on for my C drive. Everyone, please listen up. Instructions, and we have a few moments to do that. I'm going to open a new folder. I create a new folder on my C drive. I'm going to call that for the purpose of this training. I simply go here on the File Explorer, local C drive, new folder, and I call it test, and then my N number without the N. As an example, I'm doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If this is a midterm test environment, you should have instructions in front of you to name that folder your N number. So I know exactly whose work is what by the N number. For the purpose of the training today, we call it test and any number you want. I would take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or your number, N number. Just a new folder in a C drive. No, it's just on C drive. File Explorer. You're in a browser. File Explorer. Windows File Explorer. And go to this this PC. Down PC. C drive. Double click on C. And then add a new folder. Here is the button for the new folder. Alright. You don't want me to do this again to show you? Yes. Alright. So, I'm not in doing this in my web browser. I'm going to open a new file explorer down here as an example. Or, if you like keyboard shortcuts, Windows key E for Explorer pops up this. It might look different. It might look like this. Yeah. Then, among all these different views here, this is my personal work computer, so you see other things. I go down to where I see this PC. Then I go to local disk. You're shaking your head. You don't have local disk? You don't have local disk. We have a problem. Bigger than Houston. On local disk, I double click. 
This will look different for you on your trading machine or at home. Huh? Then, this is the button here for new folder. Or, if you see the whole thing, big button for new folder. Or, you could somewhere go and say, say new folder with a right click. The easiest way is to click on top here on the yellow or on the yellow here where it says new folder. I am going to do that. Pops up as new folder for the purpose of the training exercise. I call this test with my N number. My N number for the video recording is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 because I have another folder I need to kill. Let me kill this first. All right. Oh. This one we want to get rid of. So now I'm looking at a folder that's called test12345 or your end number. Yeah? If I would double click this guy, it's empty. Got that? Everyone happy? Happy as a clam? Good. Let's download our stuff. Go back to the browser. Click on the download. Click again if needed. There's a way to do this. You could do a save link as, or you just click on it. If you click on it, depending on your computer system, it might show up down here in the bottom. In my computer system, it will pop up automatically as it says, Compress Folder Tools. If that's the case, I show you now two things, two places. If that's the case, I'm a big fan of data management in drag and drop. I have here my test folder. Remember, I double clicked on that and said, it's empty. I can go now here to compress folder to my left and with a right click I just drag and drop it. Right click down. Keep it down. Right click over and say copy here. That's one way to do it. Pending on your computer system. On some of those machines here is like WinSIP or WinRA. Huh? I don't have WinSIP or WinRA. Let me show you the other way around. If that ha would happen, delete this. I need to delete it so I can show you a second time. If this doesn't pop up like here, it probably did download to downloads. Everyone, please go to your computer, File Explorer, and with the quick access, Check if you have files in your download. That and then in your downloads, you should see the file we just had downloaded. It's called Geocoding Session. It has this little zipper on the, the icon because it's a zip file. Or maybe a different icon because you have a different software installed. Depending on the software installed, what I can do is I can right click on it. I can find an open with, or I can use the function extract all. Do you guys see that? I need some feedback, guys. Huh? Adriana, are you cool? All right. Who sees there? Let's do step by step. Who has the file found in the downloads? All right, fine. So we have different options to do that. We can do an extract all. You can open it with Windows zip file or with WinZip, depending on what's in the machine. I can come over and check with you guys in a moment. Yeah? Huh? Huh? But the double click I did already. Double click I did, that the system did the double click for me automatically. Uh, I can double click this to show this again. This is the thing I just demonstrated. Or 
I go and say right click extract all and it will ask me where I want to place that that's the reason why I want to demonstrate the second step where I want to place that and I can find my test folder on the C drive test select the folder and extract all right let's give you let's double check that everyone has that in the extract folder then I should see uh, extracted folder I should see something like this who has not done that yet who's struggling fair warning with the hands it's okay to say hey I'm not here yet because you need to know that for next week on these computers. Have your test and training folder open in one window. <coughs> Go on your downloads and then you see that the file is not a zip file like in mine with a zipper, but it says like WinZip on it. Double click on it. WinZip will pop open and you will see a file is called geocoding session folder sign. Arrange both windows next to each other and just drag and drop the geocoding session from the bin zip folder of a window. Drag and drop that into your test folder we just created. Try it out. You need to understand that kind of operation to zip the file. Because that's how you submit the other one. <laughs> Apple users in the room. Like, <laughs> huh? yeah, there's, this, is, there's an extra step here because when I do work, when, when we all do it on a regular computer, this, when you find that something, it's just not so complicated. There's an extra step in it. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to Got to practice this. And the reason, the reason why I'm trying to force that zip file stuff on you is. This is your bucket. This is how you package your bucket. Yeah? That's how we can make sure that you're working in one location and get everything in there, but then you just can't take that one location and throw it into the internet or on Canvas. You need to put that into a package, and the SIP is the good way to do that. I understand there is a tool on this computer that might need five more minutes of your attention. Please invest that. I will help you if you need to get help. There are different ways to do this. The reason why there is WinSIP, it is a little bit more effective to package things in terms of compression. I think it's ridiculously annoying to deal with it. Huh? Let me help you with it. But we need to understand how to download the zip file, get the data inside in our workplace, and then how we zip our workplace up and ship it away. Huh? All right. All right. Now, we created a file folder on our C drive. We did download the data we want to use for our exercises. What else do we need? 
we need the software to do the exercises. So in this case, we're opening up ArcGIS Pro. All right? Then I want to create a new project. I want to start with a map. So I click here on my right side on the map template and it pops open here with a name and a location. So why did I create a new folder on my C drive? Because I want to use that now as my project location. Because that's my bucket. Put everything in that coffee bucket. Now speaking of coffee. That's the reason why I call this today my project. This is my geocoding example, GC for geocoding example. Example. And I have you rather have you not use spaces. Because sometimes systems are getting a little bit tricky with the space in between. All right? And new thing. Yes, please. Map. Map project. I did click here on the map. This pops open. I call it GC example. And now you can see it's completely somewhere in the forest. I want to have total control on that data. I want to have control on where is all my stuff. Okay? The most simplistic way to do that is I click here on browse. And among all these different places, I find my C drive and my test folder. See that? Found my C drive, found my test folder when I s browse for to s the place to store the project. And I click OK. So it should look like something like this. Name, GC example, location, C drive, name of the folder I just created. All right? Not allowing you to press OK. So I'm doing this, and I just take this as my main project folder. That was a question, do, I, do we do the geocoding session? No, we're doing this as a main folder. Did you explode the computer? <laughs> Apparently, you're laughing. <laughs> All right, let me click at least two more times, and then go back and help. Click this, have it load. And it pops up like that, okay? 
Next steps we're going to do is connect to a folder after I help. Okay, one problem we had, a uh, student couldn't open our curator project um, because the extract process with Vincent was still active. So you gotta close out and all that. I will give you instructions for these processes. Uh, and I'm here. The Vincent part is annoying. It's not a problem. It's just annoying. Uh, all right. So let's take a look at what we have. We are here in a project. We see a catalog and a map on my computer. If you do not see the catalog pane, this one, yeah, you can activate that with view. In view, you have a bunch of panes you can add, like these two guys. And again, I do encourage be curious about things and just put a hover over it, or maybe just say, you know what, there is a arrow behind it, so if I would click on this, I have multiple options. Yeah? Well, this is how you explore new software. What happens if I click here? Boom, computer explodes, fine, reboot, start new. <laughs> Remember, I made this fun comment, I'm that old, comma, blah, 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 blah. I'm that old that I have seen so many blue screens like lunar eclipses. Actually, more blue screens than lunar eclipses. Back in the days, Windows 90, uh, 95. Uh, don't click on this button. Why? Click. Blue screen. Uh, literally, the instruction was in the classroom. Do not check this box. If you check this box, you will, you will get, ah! Two, two students scream up. Blue screen. Reboot the whole system. Redo the project because it didn't save. Huh? That's like a, having a cardiac uh, arrest in the, in, on your computer. You don't need that. It's too much stress. GS is about people and fun. For, don't forget that. We are doing fun work here. It's like marathons are fun, but it's hard work to get there, to get your butt out of the bed at 7 a.m. to go and run those 10 miles every day. Huh? And one cheat day. Every runner is like, yeah, this is not how it works, but you're close. <laughs> I don't run. I don't. Uh, so, fine. So if you have that catalog pane, you can put that up here if you want to, or you just delete it, like I, because I have that here. I have to warn you, this on my screen will look different than on your screen. If you're working on your laptop and you have the budget for a separate monitor at home, you can move these things apart on different screens. If you're moving, like you use extended desktop, so you could use tools on the little one and on the big one, all the map. And this is somewhat annoying if you have now switched between windows in between versus have two or three things right next to each other. I try to make this arrangement at this, the most visual support in learning. Might be not efficient in workflow, but uh, so you can see, okay, this is how it's supposed to look. Your screen, you might have to make arrangements. Like the convention idea of, I use my contact contents here on the left side and I make it small right now because I see now it changes. Now, now my view is changed. Yeah? Or the right side. Well, depending on the work you will do, you might just want to get rid of that map because you're doing pure data processing. Yeah? Why do I need all the visuals if I'm only interested in a count of numbers? Okay, right. so in the catalog pane, speaking of data, let's review this again. I have here the project related data, and I have here something that's called portal. Raise your hand to be truly honest if you have not clicked yet on portal my content. Ah, I did. So, you want to try it? 
portal my content. The catalog pane, an old school software called Arc Catalog, is like a file explorer for your spatial data. The O oh, that's cool is in Arc Pro, you have the clouds included. So the moment you're logged in with your user account, this is my student's test account for class purposes, yeah. Say what? Home, where home? You will see different folders and different elements. If I log in in my administrator account, I will see like 20 different folders. But if I look here, this is stuff we have seen in the online world, did we? Remember? Well, if I click here on application data, now I have to double check which one it was. Project data. Project data. Look, there's styles layer. We just created that today. Or, or my example from last week was the drive time map, remember? I can go now and double click on a drive time map, say add and open, and I connect this guy actually to my drive time. Takes a moment. So the thing I did last week, I have now opened up in my ArcGIS Pro. I can do all the shenanigans I want. So there are ways to play up and down with the data, local and into the cloud. Some of those processes will cost you something. Time is the most feature, because you need to learn how to do that. And I will not be able to give you the whole mastery level of these tools because there's so many little ones. You got to play with this. Uh -huh. Someone will be interested in, hey, if I have Google documents, like KML files, how would I do that? There's a ways to do that. There's always two ways, front door and back door in GIS. Uh -huh. That aside, just wanted to show you there's a cool way to integrate that. Yeah, I could also now go and say, you know what? I right click, I right click on that layer, map layer from my cloud, say copy, go back to my original map and say paste. And the drive time cover area for multiple areas we did last week, I can now use for my local uh, parts and I pull it down like it would be a map from the web. That's pretty cool. So all these buckets are connected. Angelo, no high-tech technical question. We don't have the time, and I don't want to stress them too much. They are really blowing out right now with the brain. If you look this way, some are excited, like you, and some are really, really worried. This is crazy stuff. Sorry. All right. Let's get rid of this. This is just a demonstration on the options you can have. And by the way, you just learned copy and paste between different map projects and how to remove the base. What? All right. After I got rid of the whole thing. All right. So there are different ways to do this. Yeah. So right now on my online world, I see actually a drive time map. By the way, here's a preview button too. So you can actually pull all the data you're looking at into that little scheme here. In this example, the way this is packaged, I just right click on it and say add and open. So then it takes the cloud-based work and puts it here as a sub project here. Yeah. Then, do what? Is it still loading? All right, can take some time. Particularly if you do this the very first time, it has to actually generate and all that. Uh, and then I go for the purpose of demonstrating copying layers and pasting layers between different project or maps, different maps. I'm here on a drive time map. 
I'm interested in the large purple coverage. This is clearly travel. I right click on it, say copy, click, left. Left click on map, and here on map, I right click on it and say paste. Paste the copied layers into the map. And it pops up. Super easy, super valuable. Why? Because you can have multiple projects parallel open and you don't have to replicate what you have done from purple here to yellow there. You just grab the purple and copy and paste it over. Huh? Helps saving time. All right, next step, I'm gonna remove this. Right click on it and remove. The drive time map, I don't wanna have it anymore. I just get rid of it. Let's go back to the catalog. Remember, we did download some data. We want to play with this data. In catalog, I go here to project. My project is organized in different sections. One is the folders. Think about that. What we're doing, what is called connecting folders. This is like you take a garden hose and throw it into your rain barrel and you pump water out of it. For those who do not have a garden with a rain barrel, this is you take a long straw, reach over the table and suck the drink of your friend empty. Because you create with that straw, you create that connection to that drink. Or that coffee. Do, I don't share my coffee. Huh? The reason why I use the garden hose or the straw is you have that connection. Or you could say, I can't do that in terms of physical contact for that, but you could say to your friend, take your finger, point to your friend, just the fingertip on the shoulder and say, we have a connection. <laughs> that is good enough for the understanding on how this connect to a folder works. Yeah? You're creating a link to that folder. For those who have some Linux and Unix experience, there's something like a symlink. Uh -huh. Reach out, have access to that. That's the only thing. But you need to say, this is the bucket, this is the friend. You just can't do that in, with anyone. Uh, Angelo gets in trouble if he would do that with everyone. He only can do that with that one specific friend. Uh, all right, how am I going to do this? Super simple. Are you okay? Just asking. I'm glad that you have fun in this class. Okay, folders. If you click on folder, you see here the GC example. It says already folder connection. If I hover over that, Daniel, Senor Ponce. If I click on, don't click on this, I just hover over that, you can see, hey, this is the phys physical location. And it points into the folder, the project we call the GC example. Hey, wait a minute, didn't we put in our test folder geocoding session stuff? Why is that not showing up? Because we are not pointing at it. There's not that physical here, you're my friend connection. Okay, let's do this. I go here over to folder and right click on it. It says folder connection. It's like Facebook, friend request. Huh? Click on this and it pops open an explorer window and says, hey, let's find that location where you want to get connected. I know it's my C test folder. Or for the midterm, it's your CN number folder. Double click on C. Simple click works out to and it's just find my folder. Don't double click, just point click on it and say OK. So now I have that. So now this is the confusing part. I see the main folder, and I see a folder inside the main folder at the same time. Why? 
because I pull in multiple locations. I'm looking at two different garden hoses right now. One is at the big bucket and one is at the little bucket right next to it. Huh? But if I hover over that again, you can see the physical location and you get that understanding what's going on. As long as you understand to connect to that main folder you create for your projects or for your exams, that's fine. I don't really care about the cheesy example. It generates automatically because that's your project name. But if you want to import other data, this could be on the server somewhere. This could be on the L drive, 15 directories down in the rabbit hole. This could be in downloads for the purpose of the exercise and testing your achievements. Yes, download, unzip, work something, and then zip the file and upload it is an achievement. You get actually points for that. If you're able to zip the file and successfully submit the submission, you get points. You did the zip and the whole submission. Uh -huh. So now we have two folder connections. So let's double click on the folder connection test. Again, the cheesy example will keep going. It's like this ghost breathing down your shoulder right now. Huh? But now I have the folder I just unzipped. It's called Geocoding coding session. Everyone see that? I hear double clicks. Don't be trigger happy. You might go down the wrong rabbit hole. Just click simple on it to hover. Now double click. It will take a moment. What it does is it will scan the location and will pop with three different files. Oh, you gotta have three different files. If you unzip the right thing, you gotta have three different files. If not, I am not aware of what I'm doing at 2 a.m. in the morning. So I put two, I put three files in there. Do you need help? Well, you got it? Okay. For purpose of confusing you guys and give you orientation, there are different options to look at these guys. Please take a look at the screen. It says right now, item cannot preview. I'm here in the preview pane. I have here list fields and I have here thumbnails. Depending on the type of data you have in your folders, thumbnails might be nice because they give you an idea what's going to be in there. I also can take a look at metadata. Metadata is the biggest lie in a GIS world. Why? Because everyone says you must have to do it, you need to do it, you need to fill it out, it's the standard, and then you realize nobody's really doing it, unless you're in government. <laughs> yeah? We are not dealing with metadata in the classroom setup right now. I just encourage you guys, you need to take care of that and take a look at that. This is the easiest way to get outdated because you write something in and five years later you still have the text of 2013 in there. That's part of your job description if you want to deal this in a proper way. Huh? More important it is to actually have a field and say when was the item changed in the database. The date field in the item is more important than writing a paragraph in da data. But it helps to give you a summary of what you have you done. If you don't write it somewhere else, like in a, a Word document in that folder, write it down with the data. The important part is the preview. I'm looking at three different f items right now. XLSX, an Excel file. Can't display right now because I didn't double click. Do not double click. <laughs> We're going step by step. What did we hear? We have different type of tables. Well, DBF is a type of table. Yeah? Cannot preview. That's fine. Then I have a thing, it's called small wrapper. That's how I just label things when I use them to cut and move things around. So if I look at the small wrapper in the preview, it looks like this. It's just a square on top of Davy implantation. You might see this as pink, as yellow, green, blue, whatever. Huh? Single item symbology, randomly color. But I can get the idea if I have three files that are called 
a small wrapper. Well, with the preview, view, and this is the cool part, it actually shows you a base map in the back. It gives you the relative location, or actually the exact location where this is supposed to be. So if this would be now Atlanta, and I want to use that for my Davy Florida example, I know I have the wrong file. No bad surprises there. Uh, helps a little bit to coordinate. Rule of thumb, take a look at the data you get from someone. Do not trust the data you get from someone. As old saying in statistics, don't, don't trust your statistics, even if you fake them by yourself. No? Something like that. No? So be joyful with this. I spent hours just looking at data tables if I do research. Huh? Why? Because you need to understand what do you have as a gold mine sitting there before you start digging for the gold. You need to understand where is what, how can you use things. You might experience that the numbers you want to use are actually text and you need to change that because if it's one, two, three, four as a text, you can't add plus one to it. Doesn't it's like little pig plus one. You can't count that. It's text. Yes, please. Do you know if there's a you don't small wrapper is a polygon. That's the reason why I can see the polygon symbol here. I see the Excel file, I see the data table itself. Now I'm double clicking on the Excel file. If I do that, I was nice. I only have one worksheet in there. If I simple click on that worksheet, it cannot display. That's fine. But I also can go in and say, hey, this is an Excel spreadsheet, a Excel spreadsheet file with five different worksheets in there. Pick worksheet number B. And you can go in there and pick it. Yeah? So in theory, you can do some financial calculations over your customer IDs. And then if you need to do their customers, you don't have to create a separate Excel file. You just plug that in. Yeah? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this Excel file with a simple right click. Right click and say add to map. Nothing has happened, huh? Switch to the map. Simple click on the map. Now I have something is called standalone tables on the bottom. All right, everyone with me? I did right click on the spreadsheet, worksheet, right click, add to map, and then switch to the map view, what we call right now map pane. You guys doing okay? Daphne, how are you doing today? <laughs> Alright, but at least you're stating this, at least we know and I can help you. Yeah? I'm, we're, going to, we're going to do this again, step by step. Yeah? So, what is inside this table? Well, right now it says some parcels. We have no idea what's inside. So we didn't have a preview yet. We didn't open Excel yet and take a look at it. So there's a way to take a look at it. We right click here on the table. And it says open. Simple click. Most of that stuff is just simple click right now. Left click, right click, simple. Click open. Let me rearrange a few things to give you more ideas. So now this is a nasty, not really nice table with lots of appreciation, appreciate, appreciations, yeah. Um, it's actually parcel data extracted for this purpose. County, yeah, appraisal, some, some appraisal data, yeah. Remember in the PowerPoint slides, you have primary keys, you have identifiers, and you have your geocoding related information. This training exercise is about geocoding. So we need to identify and be aware of what we can use for geocoding. Huh? Duh, geocoding is about putting an A address to ma a map. Okay, well, let's take a look at the fields I have. 
I'm using this really crazy view here and just scrolling over. I have something with value here, L and D value could be land value, land units, number of units, yeah. Actually this is displaying weird. Square footage, yeah, actual year built, total living area. Yeah? This looks really like someone really had a hard time in spelling. Huh? Wait a minute. I have physical address one. Phi address one. I read that as physical address. Okay. The reason why we're looking at the table is we also want to know if there's actually something inside that field we can use. Just because the field is called physical address, it could be full of planks. Good luck with that. Oh, you gotta have something here. See here, physical dress. Those are blanks. Now it is blanks. So, what else do I have I could use for geocoding? Phi address one does look like addresses. I have Phi city for physical city. That's plantation. I can scroll down. Uh, some some Davy is coming too. Huh? And I have a zip code. That means if I have 100 Main Street, Fort Lauderdale, and the zip code to that, I can run a geocoder and say, baby, put that point on the map. All right? What else do we need to know right now that it is? So, I'm going to walk you through step by step how we geocode in Arc Pro. Yes. Puzzle number? I don't care right now. There's a lot of stuff in the table I don't care. For the purpose of geocoding, I need to, ident to put things on the map. I need to know inside the table what are my fields I can use for geocoding. And I need to know the name and that they are full, that they are filled with information. Yeah? Like example here, physical address 2. There might be one or two out of the 392 examples are filled, but not all of the addresses. Again, when it comes to geocoding, you need to control the quality of your input. That is the address. All right? Are you all scared or are you excited we're going to do one of the most powerful functions in the world when it comes to GIS? Shake it. Shake it. All right. <clears throat> if we want to use geocoding, there are different ways to start this process. The book is a little bit weird about that. Huh? There are so many tons of little features on the top of your uh, parts here. So many. Good luck in finding it the first time. Where is that button that says geocoding? Maybe on the table. Yeah? Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's a standalone table. Hmm. Yeah, here. Don't click. Yeah? I just waited 10 sec wasted 10 seconds and get confused about where it is. If I'm looking at the map here, not on my table, I don't even see the table. I don't even see my function here because it's not available right now. So I need to be here on the table. I want to cheer code. Left click on the table. My ribbons on the top will change. If I give using the GIS technical term, a dam. If I give a dam about the ribbons on the top, what's my best solution to the problem? Right click. Usually the right click gives me the options that are available to deal with that type of data or information I want to deal with. So if I right click, simple right click on it, I can remove, I can open, we did open, we see this here on the bottom. I can do some fancy visuals. I can do some advanced stuff. I can use XY data, 
I just looked into the table. I don't have XY data in this table at this time, but I know I have addresses. Sure, supervisor, give me your customer list. Give me all the, the clients we had in the last 10 years with their mailing addresses. If the mailing address is right, I can point that on a map for you. Woody's example, sure. The last 30 years of home addresses we created for people in the community, ah, I can put them on a map. I can even put them by year on the map if I want to. All right? Left click, simple left click on GeoCode table. So now here's the beauty. It actually gives you a workflow. It will tell you, hey, these are the steps we're going to do. It's almost like Hitchhiker's Guide Through the Galaxy, another good read you should do over Thanksgiving or Hurricane. Do not panic, no panic, breathe. Okay? What are you doing? Data what? Yeah, executes the same tool. You can start these same tools at different locations. This one is right easy because it's just a simple right click, it pops up. I could start this. No, wait. I could start this through tools, toolboxes, Let's go down to data management, and somewhere there's geocoding. See, it's not even geocoding here now. Geocoding tools. Go down here and say geocode address. This is how I taught 10 years ago. All that, right click on it. So all of this now is top level and simplified. So if I do the geocode table, it walks me through the tables. Yes, please. I'm not doing that table. That pop up? Uh, on the right side? Yes, sir. That's fine. Let me walk you through the visual here and then we do the tool step by step. Huh? You might not see that. This is pretty much this is the step. This is a step before the tool. Yeah? So it says take the, t be aware of your table, pretty much. What lo locator are you going to use? If you take a look at the book, you're going to build that one. We are not. We're using ArcGIS Online. Uh, fingers crossed that we all get access. Activated it last night for all of the people in the class. Uh, step three, we're mapping this whole thing out as in match the field in your table to what's in the address. Say where you want to put it and let, do, let it do the whole thing. So if I did start, you have this. Daniel and uh, Woody, do you have, see this? You have that on the screen right now. Okay. So if I want to geocode the table, if you hit on the bottom here, hit start, it will ask you about the table. We already know we are going to have multiple fields. So this is the input table. It's easy right now because we only have one table in the project, so there's only one table to show. If you're challenged with data management, do a project, a table. Combine data later. I do that on a regular basis still. Uh, because it's easier to control. Here, I have options to choose more than one field. Why? Because I already have identified the fields I need for geocoding. I understand that. Okay, click next. Pardon what? I do not understand. Well, we know that we need addresses. The address 810 Northwest 86th Avenue is located in the field physical address one. We also know physical city will contain the city name. That combines the PowerPoint theory we had earlier today about address components. What is a street regular mailing address? Yeah, but how does the system know that you need to Next step. Give me a moment. <laughs> okay, we click next. More than one field. We click next. 
Now it's asked for the input locator. You should be able to see something like this, ArcGIS World Geocoding Service or RED Geocoder. Can you see that? Can I have a really loud yes? yes? Thank you, one hour of sleep, well invested. There's this little tiny mouse button click you have to do on a web page down in the rabbit hole. All right, we're going to use the ArcGIS World Geocoding Service. The RED Geocoder is something in work in process, all right? If you don't see anything here, you might not be connected to your portal, to your ArcGIS Online. Was that a helpful cry or was it excitement? <laughs> it was excitement. All right. Then I hit next. Can we move this actually so you can see better on the bottom? Are we always going to use that option? For the purpose of this class, yes. We will not sit down and build a manual geocoding engine. That's part of the book. You can do that with the book training. But the, the chapter was read it. Be aware of it. I don't want you to sit down for an hour or two and build that thing. If at all you don't want to build it, you don't want to build it for the books example in Pittsburgh. If you want to build something like this, build it for Broward County, Florida. Huh? Or just use for the exercises we do. Sorry, Marcella, you did it. <laughs> yeah. For the purpose of this uh, class exercises, we are using the well-maintained, not always perfect, but well-maintained world geocoder from ESRI. Uh, otherwise, we are going nuts in technical details and not learning about the concepts, how we can apply that workflow. It's all about workflows. Get the data, geocode them, put them on a map, start work working relationships between those objects. All right, I click next. Now it says, let's make this bigger. Ooh, yep. <clears throat> Input address fields. Chris, this is your question. This is the fields on my site I have for my geocoding engine. This is how Esri wants to know what is what. My online geocoder does not know which field in my table is the address. So I need to tell them this is the address, this is the city, this is my zip code. Huh? So I will say the address or place, click on the field, scroll down and find my field. I know from earlier exercising here, here, physical address one. I'm going to click on this and do a field mapping as we call it. So now it knows 100 Main Street is coming. Okay, what else do I have? I can't use address 2, I do not have address 3, or something similar. I don't really have neighborhoods, but hey, I have cities. I know that there is a field and filled with data called physical city. So what I do is I do phi city. I don't have subregions, I don't have state. I have zip codes. Well, right now, zip codes this is a five digit zip code. So I take this sim simple zip code here, zip. The zip four here is your five dash four. That's US Postal Service. You, we, you don't have the dash four for this university automatically in your head. You remember it's triple three one four. That's good enough. You don't need to have the subsection. Huh? All right. So I have the three fields from the table and tell the geocoder in the, in the cloud, hey, these are the three fields you can use as an address, as a, a city, and as a SIP, and have them mapped, matched together. Huh? So they're not going to go, in this case, they're not going to go on a double date, they're going on a triple date. Huh? Group dinner. Okay, so next step. Click next. Where do you want to put that? If you play around with this, you say, I don't care. Plug it in somewhere. And you mess up in the long run. For the purpose of this exercise and the purpose of practicing how we deliver created assignments and the midterm next week, 
is we're going to want to place that where? In our bucket. So now I'm going to go and make sure that this is going to be placed in my bucket. Right now, see, it actually, if I hover over that, it is placing it in the bucket. See that again? But it's a darn long name. Huh? The way I can change my name, I click in, I can't do delete or something, it fixes it. I have to go here on the browse. Remember my old position, let me browse to my then do test position. It might open up like this, or it might open up like map. Yeah? However, look, I'm in my connected folders. I'm going into my project and I'm placing it into my map GDB. That's kind of the database right now that's associated with my stuff. I double click on it and I call it GC parcels. Geocoded parcels. Doesn't matter, it's in the same bucket, but I want you to understand you can choose the location and the name inside the bucket. Okay? <laughs> All right, so here the form is asking me where do you want to put that? I can totally ignore this and I get this output name added to the map. This is painfully long and I really, really don't like that. that I don't have control over this. So what I do is now I click on browse. And it browses to my project and my connected folders. And I double click here, go into the example, and I should have two uh, databases here. One is the example thing and the one is the map. It adds it automatically. I am going to click into map. And then it says name feature class. And I'm calling this name as GC, what did you call it? Um, parcels. I don't touch anything else. I double click that file, the, 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 the database, and then give it a name. The next step is giving it a name. Let's click save. So now, see, this is a different structure now. Now you can see the full path of that new file. All right, I'm going to give you a short exercise so you can practice that at home. Huh? So I'm really, really sure that you can do that. All right, next big step. So we find, found the file location. We know where we want to put that out. Again, as long it is in your folder, in that bucket, I will find it. I will go through with, with a magnifying class digitally and will find it. But you need to know that you save it in your bucket. Okay? Next option we need to be taken care of. This is important, guys. On this screen, the output screen, it will ask you what location type do you prefer for the address match. Address, not routing. I want for this, I want addresses. I want that on top of a building if it exists. I don't want to have it along the street. Remember the PowerPoint slides? Somewhere along the street versus this is it. Huh? I'm forcing the system to be more accurate, if possible. If the no local knowledge is in the system. And I click Next. Well, this is the cool part with Pro. It will ask you, hey, what region do you want to geocode? If you geocode against the entire world and you're missing, let's say, in your address, the state of Florida, I'm making up the number, but it happened to me as an example. If you have a zip code that's like 25025, well, every country that is using a zip code 25025 and maybe a city called Wilmington pops up. 
My example was I didn't check the addresses and I ended up in Egypt or Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, because it is a similar addressing system they use. Yeah. We don't have physical state listed right now, exactly. A way to deal with this is, hey, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Let's add a column that says country, USA, state, Florida. That's not who's printing. Are you printing again? <laughs> huh? But again, you have the power to take, to control the input of your data. If you know, okay, this is all Florida-based data, I can add the field called Florida, because you might not have all the zip codes. The question is how many Wilmingtons exist in Florida? How many Davies exist? Huh? Then you have a problem. All right, so I click here on United States, because I don't want to geocode addresses in Europe or anywhere else. Huh? And I scroll down, 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 down to next. Is there anything I want to do in a special way? No, right now I'm taking all types. It goes in with one example, then the X until it hits perfect results. It cascades down. Can be also tricky if you have not perfect uh, input. Yeah? All types is fine. And then finally I click OK. This is a review. Last chance to review all that before it uses your credit points online. Yeah? I'm OK that this is going into my bucket. And I hit run. If you needed to edit something, where would you go back? You do here. here. You do it here. If the address is wrong, I change the address here. Got it. Yeah? So ideally, if you really know what you're doing, you want that, that form at once. You don't want to have 10 different small steps. Right. You want that one data. Right click, do all in once. Yeah. And I hit run, that all did. So now this is a fun fact. Do we get the other time for it? Yeah, maybe. Um, fun fact, I have 380, uh, 328 addresses that have been matched. If I want to do a bro uh, research or a, uh, an assignment, I'm going to write this down. This is the point where I write down how many addresses have been successfully matched, ties, or unmatched. Because this is part of my justification. Hey, you're missing that $1 million home. Oh yeah, that didn't get you coded. So the awareness that you have failure in your system is important. Yes, please. Uh, if you have a geocode table fail, one common thing is you might have used a field name up here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Output. Output with a space or a number in the front. Do you have one word as a, fa as a feature class? You have a space? Take out the space. Yeah. Do you have a space? Space here in the folder in the beginning? Yeah. Spaces are not your friends if you do that stuff. Write, write long names or capitalize in between, but spaces are not your friend. Spaces are empty. Huh? They have no felt value, identity, or culture. Those are places what you need. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No extra signs, nothing. See, keep it simple. All right, so I did that. Let's run it again. It might throw an error message right now for me. All right, unmatched and ties. For purposes of demonstration, lean back, take a look. I want to start the rematch process. You don't want to start the rematch process right now. Rematching in Arc Pro on a small screen is painful because it keeps that window open. I move that around. If it lets allow me. Yeah. Now, I can go through each of the addresses. This is unmatched addresses. 
I can go through the unmatched addresses or the ties and it shows me candidates and a score and how accurate they are. We are not going to do rematching of addresses in any form in this class. This is beautiful work done. You should not do that in that beginner's level of GIS. This is editor's work. But there is a way to rematch addresses. If there's a typo, huh? or if there's an unknown thing, let's say here, I-595, this is somewhere along the interstate, it places, places a proposed address point. So you could actually say, I'm fine with this address point, if that's OK, really. But you also can say, well, I have a postal code that applies more, or I have a zip code that applies more. Yeah? And it will show you where is what, looking at the terrain. This is somewhere in, somewhere in Timbuktu. Yeah? I don't want that point. Where is that at? I didn't check that. That's in Spain. Portugal. Spain. I don't want that. Uh, even if I told the system, hey, you are in the US, it comes up with this bogus. So the perfect world is a 100% matching of your addresses. Let's take a look at your matching addresses. Your matching addresses, you can't see that in this review. You can see that in the other computer software. It actually tells you what type of locator you was used point address or along the street or is it a place if I plug in White House it will actually say a place so just because you have 100% matches it doesn't mean that you're really on top of each building where it belongs huh just because it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck it could be still a Canadian goose and you're just not aware of ducks huh but it's a animal quacking and walking. Huh? So be aware that there is an error possibility that can mess up your life. Being there, done that, takes hours of time fixing. For the purpose of our exercise in class, have a table, run the process, understand that there's possibilities for failure, but be okay with it. Create that table and look at the results. That's what I'm doing. So now in my map, I have this thing, GC parcels and black dots. I have a bunch of black dots here and a bunch of black dots down there. I can tell you from practicing and preparing, these are two dots we don't want. Yeah, simple thing. If I want to delete those two dots, I'm really sure that I want to delete those dots. I go to edit. <clears throat> I go to select. I draw over that select. I have a highlight. It tells me in the bottom right, numbers of selected features, two. In that pane here is list by selection. It even tells me again to, this is the pane I can control what I want to select on the map or not. This is the pane drawing order. I want to say where do you want to place what's, what's on top and what should have. And if I have those selected, I click delete and click save. Do you want me to repeat this? All right, in this map view, I can zoom in, identify these guys, and say, ah, now, those are no Florida people. I take the luxury, I take them out. Yeah? I use the select tool, I click here on cheesy parcels, go to edit, take selection. Remember, there are different options how do I select features in the map. I do the rectangle, left mouse, click on it while holding it down I draw you can see this dashed line 
This is where I select now. So I go close by. Let it go. I have two points up there. I have two points sitting here and right in the middle in front of me. Here, I have Florida down there, I have these two points up there. Here's the Florida stuff. Here are the ones who caused some trouble. I'm using select, click on, uh, select them like this. They're highlighted, and if they're highlighted, it's like your movie where you see the sharpshooters and the police with the laser beam looking at them. Now you pull the trigger. All right, pull the trigger means delete. Everyone can see the delete button I do. Did De delete. Now I need to save my edits down here with safe edits. Here, save the edits and click yes. You just saved 20 mouse clicks compared to different computer versions. So let's walk this through again, step by step. Go to the feature layer on your map. Here, go to edit, the edit pane, take selection, select what you need, mine is gone, delete, save. All right? Super easy, has a full one or two chapters on the book. This is super powerful, super easy to do. This is selection in the map. All right, guys, I got to go for one more step. All right, we got to do one more thing. This is very important. Hang on, guys, 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 guys. I have 16 more minutes on this. Oh, this is super, super important to make this meaningful. And I actually have stuff I can test you on. Huh? Like. Okay, guys, guys, please. Let's move the map where, where we go. We can zoom in manually or we can right click here and say zoom to layer. Since we. Ex killed those two guys up north, we can actually zoom in and we clo get closer. There's still some bogus data, but fine. We'll zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Let's take a look how this looks like. C key to move around. Yes, and we can do the whole thing with changing symbology, like here, G parcel, uh, cheesy parcels, appearance, change symbology, all different units, okay? I want to do that one. Why? Because I want to do a quality control check. Did my geocode, I geocode everything where it belongs. One way to check could be I go first feature class, symbology, excuse me, symbology, and say unique values. This is like chapter two and chapter three combined. In unique values, I can select a field. Hey, this field tells me which unique value you should display for me. Well, location name doesn't help me, but down there I remember I had city. And you can see there's a lot of stuff now in the table we did not have before. Because the data, the geocoder added all that. And I want to select the fields called Phi City. Now this is the pain. It actually adds user underscore original field name to it. So now, because I geocoded it with the way we presented it, it is called now user Phi City. If I click on that, it pops up. It might tell you the multiple users here. You might say add values, etc. Yeah. Change color settings if I want to. And I just click OK. 
Did it change already? I need something different. Unselect, unselect is in map. Clear. Huh? So, I changed the symbology. I actually did it wrong. Should change it for Davy. Change the symbol for, for Davy. Super simple, no massive mouse clicks. It's just like I double click on Davy, I double click on Plantation and it pops up. So what I see right now on the screen is I'm showing my geocoded addresses and the symbology shows here on the left side the physical city and if you know the locality you will see that there's one black square mapping Davy and it's in the middle of plantation. You see that? So this guy needs to have a conversation with your geocoder and rematch. Yeah? So using simple variations in or different ways to display your data with symbology can help you to find a mistake in the process. This one is definitely wrong. These guys, I don't really know where exactly the boundaries of Western are, so this might be a problem. But I know for sure this is plantation. Okay? How else could I select something? Well, if I go to map or data map map and I'm on cheesy parcel here. I have select by attribute and select by location. We don't have the time for select by location. Well, we have select by attribute. What does this mean? There is a table in this icon. It shows locations on the map and a table. What was the lecture earlier this morning about? Data in your table. How can I do data in a table? I can sort, I can find, I can select. Hey, let's do this. Right. I click select by attributes. For those who have exposure to technology prior to this class, structured query language, SQL, is your friend in this. I hope this is a stretch, not a victory run. Huh? So you could do this with SQL. Good luck with that. <laughs> I have cheat sheets for this, and I'm doing this since more than two decades. Huh? My, my, cheat sheets, my cheat sheets are usually like little help buttons for this type of data. You need to do this kind of statement. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to the fun fact that it says click add clause to begin building your query. Oh, yep. click add clause. Hello, Santa. You have seen this in Excel, when you do, let's say, conditional form editing in Excel. Color the cell blue when it's above 10 uh, data points. I use that button that said add clause. You use the button that said what? Here, add clause to begin. I do that. Select by attribute. On a cheesy parcel, select by attribute, click on this, get select by attribute tool. Alright? Add clause button. So now I'm going to move this a little bit so we can see how this works. I can pick the field name I want to. This is about now. This select everything that is true to this kind of clause, where clause. Select everything in my data that is city of plantation. So now I need to know, I want to select everything which is in my data, field, the physical city, down here, user phi city, is equal, you can see here, different versions, different ways. If it's text, if it's numbers, you can do different things. Yeah? It's equal to 
and now I can go to values and it goes through your data table and tells you, hey, you can select from these values. I want to select, this is how I talk to myself about this. I want to select from my current data everything that is within the city of uh, plantation or is city of plantation. Plantation. And I click add. All right, let's run this. Now everything turned into bluish colors because that's my selection color. So everything on the map right now, highlighted here, is selected as city of plantation. All right. So what else can I do with that? What about land values? All right, add a clause. Now, I have a Boolean operator. I can make this and, or, or anything else. And I want to select something that is where the city is equal to plantation. And my land value, user LND val, is, let's say, greater than or equal to and now it lists all the values that are listed in the database and I just pick one of the last two ones and click the add button all right and then I hit run where are they selected feature zero why is that? There is no city of plantation having that value. All right, let's click on this again on the edit button. Edit. And say, yeah, this little edit button, let's go back here. Let's click here on the edit clause. Let's do something different. Let's do a lower number, 100,000 something, and click update. Land value. Yeah. So I'm using here now the land value field and the where clause or the condition is select everything that is within the with, this is called the select everything where the data table says the city is plantation and additional condition and the land values right now known is greater than or equal to that value. Yes, please. Can you then export those selections? Yes, I can. I can add any combination of logic to this. One really cool thing is I can change this and say, you know what? Just give me everything which is above average. Whole universe of data points, calculate the above average, and show them which ones are in the city of plantation. Yeah, update and run. So again, here, check, go here on that clause. That's the clause I want to change. If I want to edit the clause on plantation, let's say to a different city, I can just easily do that and click update. I don't want that. All right, there are thousands of ideas how to do this. No answer, uh, questions right now. If I, if I have that, I click X, exit out here. I have these selected. Yeah. Some point down here, you might see now here in my case, I have 29 selected on the bottom. Here in the bottom line, you get additional information. I also can see here, if I change the content, 29 are selected. Huh? So how do I deal with them in the next step? Right now, is I have 29 fingers on these and say, I want you, 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 and you. You need to come with me. All right? The invite to come with them is super simple. Remember when I said all the cool stuff comes with right clicks? Well, right click.
data, export. Repeat. This is the sign for repeat. All right. This is something is wrong. I'm actually. This is the sign for I'm going nuts. This is repeat. All right. I have the selections here, all the file here. I right click on it. I go data, export. I have actively selected 29 features. I expect now 29 features in a new uh, export function. I do that. Say, okay, this is the one stuff I have. Right now, I don't care. Let's call it 29. Can change that to copy 29 if I want to. Naming conventions, we learn about that later. And I click run. And I X out. And it did add a new file. It's called GC parcels copy 29. I still see the selections. I clear out. And for the purpose of showing you guys how easy that was. I get rid of everything, and these now are city of plantation above average of my data set. Okay? Two more minutes of craziness. Yay! Once you're done with all your work, what, what didn't we do yet at all? Save. All right. Save. Yeah, exit out. If it asks you to confirm the save, confirm. Where did you click your save? I'm sorry. Project save. Project tab to the top left. Okay. Just save. Huh? Or X out and confirm save. No. All right. Oh, it's not really gone, gone. All right, remember, remember when we did, remember when we did open up our own little folder. Okay. If I go now to GC example, in my test folder, there's this folder GC example and geocoding session. Geocoding session, we did import, present our data. If I click to the project, we call GC example. I now have an ArcGIS project file called GC example. Okay. So if you saved it the right way, everything should be in there. All right. So how do I get that stuff? Or how would you be able to share that on, let's say, a jump drive? Well, let's go to your C drive. Go to your C drive. And you see your folder called tests and your number. I want you to right click on it. All the happiness is right click. In my case, it says send to compressed zip folder. If I want to zip my folder, I go to File Explorer, go to C Drive, right click on the folder I want to compress and say send to zip folder. On a student's lab computer machine, it might appear differently. I will come back to the lab. I will make screenshots and, or, and or a very detailed write up on how does this look on your WinZip environment? So you have at least one person show or look, take a look at this, so we can foolproof that process. What I mean with foolproof this process is, if I compose this now as compressed zip folder, yep, that's the reason why because I, my computer tells me I can't create that stuff on my C drive. Somewhere on my desktop, I have now a zip file like this one here. Yeah, I just created that. This is all what I've done today with you guys. Crunched into a zip file, ready to send up and submit to, let's say, Canvas. I will give you a short video demonstration how to do that. Then go a different location, output location. I will double check that. Give me until Monday. Not sure if I get it done tomorrow. No? You, you will get a small video instruction how to do that. 
I also will have a test upload on Canvas. Remember when I said I give you a mini test case to repeat all this, what we did in two hours, so you can practice a little bit faster and repeat those steps because those steps just need to repeat. Huh? I will give you a mini test setup for geocoding. And part of that is download the zip file, extract, geocode, do the map, select, and upload the whole thing again. And you need to do this test. So I have physical proof that you have been successfully enabled to upload a zip file with your GIS work into Canvas. Because if you test this on Monday or Tuesday, you are not struggling on stressing out on how to get data down and up to me for your grade. And the only thing you are testing on now at that is do the thing in the, in the exam. Not plug the data in, plug it up. So one struggle less and one point more to happiness. Okay? Let's reflect what we have done in the last few days, sessions. We learned how to deal with the online world. Simple web map, let's say add traffic counts to it. Yeah? We learned in business analysts, find a location in different ways, search for businesses, yeah? do Location-driven analysis based on drive time. Did we do radius? No. Did we do walking time? No. So I would think if drive time is part of the exam, I will ask for drive time. I'm not going to ask you do walking time because we did not have an active inter interaction with that. Uh -huh. This is part of the reflection and as in, hey, this is important, this could come. We have done drive time already lots of time. Huh? We did infographics, standards. We did reports, standards, customized reports. We are good at that. Huh? We did digitizing. Huh? And we did geocoding. So among all these, I will ask you to do one or two little things or one larger one, combination of such. It's workflow oriented, meaning if there are three little tasks in the setups, in the test, you can, if you, if you have trouble with one, you can still do the other ones. All right? Practice, practice, practice. This is like riding a bicycle. You crash a few times, but then you're getting better. You're not, you're not riding for the Tour de France right now, but you're getting better and better and better. I'm going to struggle too, so.